I'm Alice Loxton, and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things royal history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. You've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount for History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details in the video description and use the code REALROYALTY, all one word, when you sign up. Now, on with the show. On August the 22nd, 1642, near the town of Nottingham, an ancient and traditional ceremony was performed. Before his loyal and devoted followers, the royal standard was raised, and King Charles I's proclamation of war was read out. As the folds of his personal flag crackled and billowed over his head, it was announced that any man who took up arms against the king would be considered a traitor. But in the long war that followed this dramatic scene, the king would be utterly defeated. His parliamentarian enemies would eventually capture him and have him tried and executed. For King Charles Stuart, first of that name, standing proudly beneath his colors, the shadow of the axe already hung over his head. No other English king has ever inspired such intense and different emotions as Charles I. Without doubt, the enormity and magnitude of events during his 24-year reign had a profound effect upon English history. To his supporters, Charles was the royal martyr, a dignified, careworn gentleman a victim of betrayal. To his detractors, he was that man of blood, a distant, obstinate architect of a calamitous civil war. In the many portraits of him that still exist, it is his eyes that draw the onlooker, their sadness seeming to anticipate his tragic end. Never, said the sculptor Bernini, have I beheld a countenance more unfortunate. So how could this well-mannered, gentle and pious man provoke a bloody civil war? How could a king, who throughout his life would claim that he acted only in the interests of his people, end that life with his head on the block? Part of the answer lies in King Charles' early life for it was here that he encountered many of the influences that were to critically shape his character and opinions. These same influences would ultimately lead him to the scaffold. When Prince Charles was born in Scotland in 1600, many of his father's courtiers believed he would not survive infancy. His small stature feeble legs and unfortunate speech impediment made the young Prince Charles a shy, self-conscious child. As he grew older, Prince Charles was determined to overcome his childhood frailties and to acquire the physical accomplishments worthy of a royal prince. The quiet, introverted Charles hero-worshipped his glamorous, confident brother, Prince Henry. Prince Charles was to be the first monarch wholly brought up in the Anglican Church, and he remained a devout and loyal member of the Church of England until his death. Although Charles was never the scholar his father had been, he worked hard, and as ever, his desire to emulate Prince Henry inspired him. But in 1612, his world was to fall apart. His beloved brother, Henry, suddenly fell ill and died of typhoid. As heir apparent, Prince Charles immediately became an important figure at his father's court. 
King James wished to establish himself as a mediator between the Catholic powers of Spain and France and the Protestant Dutch and German states. He had already married his daughter Elizabeth to the Protestant Elector Palatine in Germany, and he knew that if he could balance this by marrying Charles to a French or Spanish princess, his influence in European politics would greatly increase. But as King James negotiated, his son and heir was falling under the influence of a man who did more than any other to undermine the Stuart monarchy. Ironically, the man was known as the royal favorite. His name was George Villiers. The homosexual King James' open infatuation and preferment of George Villiers left his son a disastrous legacy. From being a penniless young man, Villiers rose rapidly to become Duke of Buckingham. His physical beauty and superficial graces disguised an arrogant vanity and political incompetence. The truth was that Villiers used his influence at court to monopolize royal favors for himself and his followers. Charles, friendless and withdrawn, had never filled the great void in his life left by the death of his brother. And Villiers, confident, handsome, and cultured, gradually overcame Prince Charles's hostility to become his new role model. In 1623, Prince Charles and Villiers persuaded King James to allow them to travel incognito to Madrid to woo the Spanish Infanta. Calling themselves Jack and Tom Smith, the two men had soon given themselves away and by the time they reached Spain, their mission was almost laughable and common knowledge to all. Charles's actions severely embarrassed the Spanish and English authorities. But worst of all, Prince Charles, in a moment of madness, promised to grant concessions to English Catholics in return for the Infanta's hand. The fear and loathing with which most English Protestants regarded Catholicism or popery was based on the belief that a Catholic rising was being constantly prepared. Stories of massacres and atrocities perpetrated by Catholic soldiers in Protestant Germany reached England. Fear became hysteria. When eventually Charles returned to England, having disavowed his promises to Spain, the English people rejoiced. However, Prince Charles and George Villiers determined to avenge their humiliation by declaring war on their recent hosts. Against his better judgment, King James agreed to support their enterprise, and Parliament was called to Whitehall Palace to hear Villiers' biased account of their Spanish venture. Prince Charles, completely under the influence of the Duke and very self-conscious of his stammer, sat in silence, nodding his assent. Parliament enthusiastically declared in favor of war. In March 1625, King James died and Prince Charles duly succeeded him. As the new King's chief minister, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, had total control of royal policy. Within a short time, Buckingham swiftly alienated public and parliamentary support for the new monarch. It was in these three years that Buckingham ruled England that the first steps on the road to the ruinous civil war were taken. Like his father, King Charles believed implicitly in the divine right of the monarch to rule. In this dogmatic doctrine, the king was appointed by and answerable only to God, and Parliament and the Church 
were authorities subservient to the king's wishes to use as and when he saw fit. Unlike his father, however, King Charles had neither the tact, sensitivity or statesmanship to come to a working compromise with a parliament jealous of its privileges. Three months after his father's death, King Charles married a young French Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria. In arranging a marriage for Charles to the sister of the French king, Buckingham hoped to gain an ally for his military assault on Spanish territory. But disaster was to follow as Henrietta Maria openly flaunted her detestation of Protestantism on her arrival in England. Before long, bitter arguments with King Charles were rumored at court. King Charles then tried to eject his queen's French entourage. It was the last straw. The French alliance disintegrated into another declaration of war. To finance military expeditions against Spain and France, King Charles obviously had to summon Parliament. He did not, however, feel bound to inform Parliament of his plans. Insulted by King Charles's lack of respect, Parliament demanded the enforcement of anti-Catholic laws and the removal of Buckingham in return for their support. Taking their opposition as a personal affront, the King's response was tactless and arrogant. He dismissed Parliament and started to levy forced loans and taxes without their consent, reminding them that Parliaments are in my power for their calling, sitting and dissolution. Therefore, as, as I find the fruits of them good or evil, they are to continue or not to be. And remember, if in this time, instead of mending your errors, by delay you persist in your errors, you make them greater and irreconcilable. Whereas, on the other side, if you do go on cheerfully to mend them, you will do yourselves honour. You shall encourage me to go on with parliaments. The Duke of Buckingham's grandiose schemes to cover himself in glory collapsed in a mire of mismanagement and corruption. A series of expensive expeditions to support Protestant French strongholds failed dismally. Parliament now demanded Buckingham's impeachment and with the King's agreement to a petition of right. In an attempt to play politics, King Charles tried to avoid committing himself. But the considerable unrest in the country finally forced his hand. He signed the petition, which meant he could no longer levy taxes, force loans or imprison his enemies without Parliament's consent. If this was not enough, in August 1628, the king suffered a further personal setback. This day, between nine and ten of the clock in the morning, the Duke of Buckingham was by one Felton, once a lieutenant in this our army, slaw at one blow with a dagger knife. But presently, plucking out the knife from himself, he made toward the traitor and then fell, though he were upheld by divers that were near him. They could not perceive him hurt at all, till they saw the blood come gushing from his mouth and the wound, so fast that life and breath at once left his begored body. Perversely, Buckingham's death served to avert the political crisis which was now facing King Charles. Peace negotiations were opened with Spain and France, and the Privy Council debated sounder policies. Free from Buckingham's meddling, the King was able to devote more time to his wife. One of the most attractive traits of the King, his faithful love of his wife, blossomed and was returned. 
Charles lavished affection on Henrietta Maria. And from 1630 to 1644, this love was extended to the eight children she bore him. But the strength and happiness King Charles derived from his wife was also to become a political liability. In March 1629, amidst chaotic scenes, John Eliot and Denzel Hollies, the leaders of the opposition, introduced three resolutions to the House of Commons. The resolutions against popery and the levying of taxes were passed only after the speaker was physically held in his chair. But before the king's supporters could react, Parliament dissolved itself. Terrified by the radicalism of Eliot and his followers, many moderate members of the Commons switched allegiance to the king. Comforted by the sudden wave of public sympathy and support, the king felt he could do as he wished. And so for 11 years, from 1629 to 1640, he chose not to call Parliament. Freed from the political pressures of a troublesome Parliament, King Charles was able to devote more time to his other interests. His love of art spurred him to amass a huge collection of paintings and sculptures. Great painters of his day, such as Rubens and Van Dyck, journeyed to England under royal sponsorship to paint the royal family. King Charles's court contrasted sharply with that of his father. Charles's quiet dignity, excellent manners and modest behaviour set high standards he expected his courtiers to emulate. The atmosphere of his court certainly reflected Charles's lofty views of kingship. For example, no person, apart from the Queen herself, was permitted to sit in the royal presence. To most of his followers and servants, the King was a distant, unapproachable figure. Unfortunately, King Charles's happiness enjoyed during the 1630s was to carry a high price. For Parliament's grievances did not disappear, but denied a platform, continued to increase. Without a Parliament, King Charles became even more isolated from the realities of facing his own people. Furthermore, to finance his government, the king was forced to resort to measures which affected all levels of society. Suddenly, the gentry, merchants, professional men and landowners who made up parliament felt the weight of the king's taxes. Fines, sales of monopolies, the extension of crown lands and increased customs duties gave the appearance of a royal administration out of control. But it was the vexed question of religion that was to prove the major problem for King Charles. As the war in Europe became a Protestant life-or-death struggle, all Englishmen feared the worst. Queen Henrietta Maria became the focus of a rise in Catholic conversions amongst the gentry. And in 1637, a papal representative was welcomed at Whitehall. Before long, it was widely rumoured that Charles intended to reintroduce popery. Not untypically, King Charles chose to completely ignore the fears of the population. To compound the problem, the religious reforms of Archbishop Lord, Charles's chief minister, were perceived as an opening of the door to Catholicism. But what King Charles wanted and needed was a uniform, traditional Anglican Church governed by bishops appointed by him, enforcing the royal will. Determined to turn the clock back, the king did all he could to silence those who wished for more radical change. He particularly detested the growing minority of Puritans, 
a branch of the Anglican Church. Puritans wanted simple services and plain churches, and more importantly, they wanted to choose ministers for themselves. In the king's eyes, this was a fundamental attack on his right to determine religious policy. What was more, the Puritan leaders were unequivocal in their damnation of popery, and so King Charles and Archbishop Lord enforced doctrines to turn the Puritans out. Of course, what this heavy-handed policy achieved was merely to make martyrs and to gain sympathy for their cause. But King Charles remained unmoved at the growing resentment of his policies throughout the country. While England remained at peace, his government could happily continue without recourse to Parliament. Then, in July 1637, he received disquieting news. The Scots had united in rejecting Lord's reforms of their church. In a fury, King Charles raised an army to enforce his authority on them. When this ramshackle and reluctant force army was defeated, King Charles was left with no option but to summon a parliament. When Parliament finally assembled, the House of Commons refused to grant funds before their grievances were addressed. But true to form, King Charles refused to compromise. Once again, the King's tactless and inflexible manner had created a crisis. The Earl of Strafford, the King's chief minister, was unable to reach an agreement with Parliament and within three weeks it was dissolved. But events soon overtook the king as a Scottish army crossed into northern England and defeated the royal army. The powerless King Charles had no alternative. He had to summon another parliament. This time, fully aware of the strong position it was in and led skillfully by John Pym, Parliament was determined to have its way. The Long Parliament, as it came to be known, deeply humiliated and embittered King Charles. First, he was forced to sacrifice his trusted ministers, notably the Earl of Strafford, whose death warrant Charles was forced to sign. The shame and dishonour of sending a loyal servant and friend to the gallows stayed with the king to his dying day. Strafford's execution opened the floodgates of reform. Archbishop Lord was imprisoned and Parliament voted to dissolve only at its own consent. The king was forced to grant many further privileges to the House of Commons, which, if he had given freely in the preceding weeks, would have averted the crisis. Charles, seeing his power slowly diminish, turned to his queen for help. It was a fatal decision, for Henrietta Maria, a Catholic, brought up in an absolute monarchy, had no understanding of these religious issues and passionately supported her husband's right of supreme authority. Increasingly isolated from the reality, it was clear that the royal couple had no clear policy aims. It was now that King Charles made his most terrible political mistake. In January 1642, King Charles burst into the House of Commons in an attempt to arrest five of its members. This single action, more than any other, succeeded in completely alienating the king from his people. The enormity of this deed struck at the very heart of parliamentary government, its traditional law and the rights of the subject. Charles's desperate tactics had played right into his enemy's hands. If this were not enough, the king then compounded his folly. Fearing for his wife's safety, he took her away from London. At a stroke, 
the center of English trade, commerce and administration was surrendered to the parliamentary side. Queen Henrietta Maria took ship for Europe and King Charles wandered north, raised his standard at Nottingham and published pamphlets justifying his rights and actions. There was now no turning back. The English Civil War had truly begun. It was on the 23rd of October, 1642, at Edgehill in Warwickshire, that the Royal Army's resolution had its first test. The bloody aftermath of the indecisive battle stunned King Charles, for amongst the dead were his cousin, Lord Daubigny, and 60 of his lifeguard. Shaken by the violent realities of warfare, Charles convinced himself that his enemies would sue for peace. However, his gallant nephew, Prince Rupert, saw the opportunity to strike a decisive blow against the parliamentarian forces who had retreated to London. But as was to happen so often throughout the Civil War, Charles was crippled by indecision. By the time his mind had been changed, the moment had passed, and the citizens of London, backed by Parliament troops, were able to resist him. In December 1642, Charles wrote a prophetic letter to one of his closest supporters. He was still dwelling on his failure to protect the Earl of Strafford. I will either be a glorious king or a patient martyr, and as yet not being the first, nor at present apprehending the other, I think it now no unfit time to express my resolution to you. One thing more. My failing to one friend hath indeed gone very near me, wherefore I am resolved that no consideration whatsoever shall ever make me do the like. During 1643, from his headquarters in Oxford, King Charles oversaw the conduct of the royalist war effort. His indecisive nature made it increasingly difficult for his generals to exploit local successes in the north and west. Overcrowding in Oxford led to clashes amongst his officers over lodgings and supplies, and the brusque manner of his cavalry commander, Prince Rupert, contributed to friction and intriguing. Furthermore, the shower of knighthoods and governorships which the king bestowed for good service caused resentment amongst those he had failed to satisfy. To his great joy, King Charles was reunited with his queen, who had brought back much needed supplies from the continent and was soon involved in intrigues at the Oxford court, which was modelled on the happier days of the past. Plays and music were performed, and entertainments for the fashionable were arranged. In fact, life began to assume an air of normality. But in 1643 came shattering events that burst this idyllic bubble. Parliament had signed the Solemn League and Covenant with the Scots, and a Scots army was preparing to invade in support of his opponents. The intervention of this well-led Scottish army tipped the scales in favour of Parliament. In July 1644, an Anglo-Scottish army combined to inflict a telling defeat on Prince Rupert at Marston Moor. Now the North was lost. Soon a revitalised Parliament had made vital changes to its structure and organisation. Moderate generals who had failed to prosecute the war satisfactorily were replaced by men committed to the king's defeat. A new model army, well trained, regularly paid and under unified command, was created to be hurled against the king. Despite this calamitous defeat, Charles refused to negotiate any concession with Parliament. Queen Henrietta Maria again returned to France 
having made her husband promise he would consult her on all matters of policy. Again, the king's lack of resolution contributed hugely to the uncertainty and disaffection, for he would not commit himself to decisive action in the north or west. Instead, he optimistically pinned his hopes on fantastic rumors of parliamentary disunity. By June 1645, King Charles's dithering and reliance on the advice of untalented courtiers allowed Parliament to combine its forces to outnumber his. Rather than effect a retreat, King Charles decided to give battle to the Parliament's new model army at Naseby. Watching the battle at the head of his lifeguard, the King saw his forces buckle and waver under determined attack. Courageously, Charles decided upon a counter-attack in which he would personally lead his men. But before he could enter the battle, one of his officers seized his horse, crying, Would you go upon your death in an instant? And quickly turned him away. The king's beaten army crumpled and fled from the field. The king was now a virtual fugitive from his subjects. Charles spent a year aimlessly traveling from one place to another to avoid capture. Even now, he steadfastly refused to accept the inevitable, as one by one his garrisons and strongholds were captured or surrendered. As his military forces disintegrated and his generals went into exile or compounded for their estates, Charles decided on one last desperate gamble. In April 1646, he secretly left beleaguered Oxford and travelled north. And on May the 5th, the king rode into the Scots army quarters near Newark and surrendered himself. These instructions to Henrietta Maria show that he had perhaps accepted his likely fate. I conjure you, by all that you love, by all that is good, that no threatenings, no apprehension of danger to my person, make you stir one jot from any foundation in relation to that authority which Charles is born to. I have already cast up what I am like to suffer. Only I desire that consolation, that assurance from you, as I may justly hope that my cause may not end with my misfortunes, by assuring me that misplaced pity to me do not displace my son's right. No man's person ought to be put in balance with this cause. Whilst in the hands of the Scots, Charles gave the impression of a man genuinely interested in reaching a negotiated settlement with Parliament. The illusion was shattered when it was discovered that he had been secretly plotting to land an Anglo-Irish army in England to continue the war. It was now obvious that Charles's world meant little. He was quite prepared to renege on agreements, go back on promises, or break bonds in pursuance of his aims. For the king, duplicity was easy and his opponents learned never to trust him again. The negotiations wore on. King Charles still refused adamantly to commit himself to any permanent change in church or state. He was in a desperately difficult situation. Alone, powerless and imprisoned, but clinging stubbornly to the principles in which he believed. The Scots had assumed that his surrender to them meant he wished to sign their covenant. King Charles had assumed his countrymen would respond to his personal appeal for military support. Both were wrong. As 1647 began, the Scots left England and gave its king back to Parliament for a fee of £400,000. The unhappy monarch was escorted by his new captors back to Holland B. House in Nottinghamshire. 
The alliance between the Scots and English was now crumbling fast, and the English Parliament was becoming more and more divided between Presbyterians who wanted a negotiated peace with the king and the more radical independents. The independents were Puritans who wanted a church free of outside influence from bishops or councils, and they were certainly growing in power. The base of that power was in the army, which was furious at Parliament's attempts to disband it without pay. Within the army, the revolutionary political views of another group, the Levellers, were starting to gain more and more influence. Although he was initially depressed at being surrendered to Parliament, King Charles's optimism soon returned. His morale was boosted by news of Parliament's difficulties, which convinced Charles that all was not lost, if only he could buy time for himself and his followers. He therefore agreed to a scheme that imposed Presbyterianism for just three years. But the army, led by the independents, would also take action. On June the 3rd, a small band of soldiers led by Cornet Joyce arrived at Holdenby to take charge of the king and remove him to Hampton Court. The king accepted, saying their warrant was written in as fair and legible hand as I have seen. As the army began to assume more power and influence, King Charles managed to convince himself that he was vital to their cause. Through the autumn of 1647, he listened grandly to their various proposals at Hampton Court. However, the army leaders were under pressure from the rank and file to stop their fruitless negotiating and begin their program of revolutionary democracy. The abolition of the monarchy was amongst their chief demands. Rumours abounded that the army wanted to bring him to trial, and this led Charles to undertake his next unwise adventure. On November the 11th, 1647, he slipped down an unguarded staircase to a waiting horse. Making good his escape, he crossed to the Isle of Wight and was therefore free for the first time in 18 months. On his arrival, he told the islanders, I must inform you that for the preservation of my life, I was forced from Hampton Court for there were people called levellers that had both voted and resolved of my death so that I could no longer dwell there in safety. And desiring to be somewhat secure till some happy accommodation may be made between me and my parliament, I must put myself in this place. For I desire not a drop more be spilt of Christian blood. Neither do I desire to be chargeable to any of you my resolution in coming here being but to be secured till there may be some happy accommodation made. Charles's freedom was to be short-lived. He had gone to the Isle of Wight, believing that he would be able to influence its governor, Colonel Hammond, into supporting his cause. But Colonel Hammond, shocked by the arrival of his royal visitor, maintained his loyalty to Parliament. The King was arrested and removed to Carisbrook Castle, where he was placed under closer supervision than ever before. Amidst a growing atmosphere of unreality, the King continued to negotiate with Parliament and the army. But secret letters written by Charles to Henrietta Maria revealed that he had no intention of reaching a settlement with them. These letters were eventually intercepted by the army and a complex network of royalist agents was gradually uncovered. As security was tightened and the king's servants dismissed, King Charles planned yet another escape. The first attempt failed when he was unable to squeeze through a narrow window. The next ambitious plan 
which calls for the king to disguise himself and switch places with a visitor, failed as well. And in May 1648, a desperate final escape attempt was foiled, as his plan to slip through his cell window, lower himself by rope to waiting supporters below, and escape by boat was discovered. Under close guard, and with a garrison now reinforced by 500 soldiers, the king spent a frustrating summer at Carisbrook. His spirits had been lifted by the news of the series of rebellions and uprisings on the mainland in his name. But the scattered royalists in Kent, Essex, Wales and the North were defeated piecemeal by the new model army. There was still hope that perhaps the Scots army could defeat Parliament. But in August 1648, after a rapid march north, the new model army had defeated and scattered the Scots at Preston. The Royalist rebellion was now destroyed, and with it went the final hopes of the king. All hope of redemption had gone. His trial was now a certainty. In the first week of January 1649, soldiers of Parliament entered the great chamber of Westminster Hall and a thorough search was made of the entire building. The representatives of the people of England were about to commit the King of England to trial for his life. The melancholy figure of King Charles had been moved under heavy guard from the Isle of Wight to a series of secure lodgings. Passively, he waited for the final chapter of his life to begin. On January the 20th, 1649, King Charles was escorted to Westminster Hall to face his accusers for the first time. Thus far, his life had been a drama in which, all too often, he had been miscast. However, he would excel in the role he was about to play. He sat silently and impassively as the charge was read. He was accused of plotting to overthrow the rights and liberties of his people, maliciously levying war against them, negotiating with foreign powers to invade England, and renewing the conflict after his defeat. He was therefore responsible for all the treasons, murders, rapines, burnings, spoils, desolations, damages and mischiefs to this nation. He was impeached as a tyrant, traitor and murderer, and a public and implacable enemy to the Commonwealth of England. At the last accusation, the King laughed scornfully. It was to be his finest hour. All trace of shyness, any hint of his lifelong stammer, any hint of hesitation, all disappeared as the King spoke in a calm, clear, unfaltering voice. I would know by what power I am called hither. I would know by what authority, I mean lawful. Remember, I am your king, your lawful king, and what sins you bring upon your heads and the judgment of God upon this land. Think well upon it, I say think well upon it before you go from one sin to a greater. I have a trust committed to me by God, by old and lawful descent. I will not betray it to answer a new, unlawful authority. Therefore, resolve me that, and you shall hear more of me. The King's refusal to acknowledge the Court's authority had of course been expected. But the eloquence with which he conducted his argument had not. In a series of rapid exchanges with John Bradshaw, the president of the court, Charles clearly came off the better. By refusing to recognize the court or answer the charges against him, he exposed the flimsy nature of the legal proceedings. Anxious that the king's defiance should not sway opinion in his favor, Bradshaw ordered his removal. Amidst cries of justice and God save the king! 
Charles was escorted out. By the time Charles was summoned before the court again, both sides had carefully planned their next move. The parliamentary commissioners had decided that the king's refusal to answer charges of treason were to be treated as an admission of guilt. The king's response to this charge of tactics was to lucidly attack the court's authority to make laws without precedent. Once again, he had coolly and fluently made a telling legal point. If it were only my own particular case, I would have satisfied myself with the protestation I made the last time I was here against the legality of the court. But it is not my case alone. It is the freedom and the liberty of the people of England. And do you pretend what you will, I stand more for their liberties. For if power without law may make laws, may alter the fundamental laws of the kingdom, I do not know what subject he is in England that can be sure of his life or anything he calls his own. And therefore, under favour, I do plead for the liberties of the people of England more than you do. The king was once again removed from the court. As he was escorted out, one of his guards, moved by his dignity, muttered, God bless you, sir. As the king thanked him, the soldier was struck by an officer with a cane. Charles Riley observed that the punishment exceeds the offence. The second session of the trial had advanced the justice of Parliament's case no further. The same situation of impasse bedeviled the third session the next day. London was rife with rumour. The uncertainty of the people transmitted itself to the court and led to disunity amongst the commissioners. The enormity of what they were doing had finally dawned on some, who were keen to wash their hands of the whole episode. As the last session of the trial began, Lord President Bradshaw managed to rally the wavering judges to go ahead with the pronouncement of the King's sentence the waverers were bullied into compliance. Bradshaw pronounced that as King Charles had declared war on his subjects, he had broken his contract to protect his people. The king was found guilty on all charges, and at the sentence of death, the commissioners stood to signify their agreement. As Westminster Hall echoed to cries of execution, justice, pious and devout to the end, he spent his last days in prayer and Christian contemplation with Bishop Juxon. On the day before his execution, he said a heart-rending farewell to two of his children, Prince Henry and Princess Elizabeth, impressing on the tearful couple the justice of the cause for which he was about to die. The king spent his last hours in his old palace of Whitehall, where he had enjoyed so many happy years. It was on January the 30th, 1649, that King Charles Stuart made his last journey to the scaffold. The weather was bitterly cold, and to prevent his enemies being able to claim he was shivering in fear, Charles wore two shirts. The scaffold was placed in front of another of Charles's favourite buildings, Banqueting House. The large crowd that gathered to witness his execution death was kept back by ranks of troops. For Charles, the end had come. He removed his last jewel, the insignia of the garter, and placed it in the trembling hand of Bishop Jackson, saying only one word. Remember. Charles then made his last speech from the scaffold. I never did begin the war with the two houses of Parliament, and I will call on God, to whom I must shortly make an account, to witness that I never did intend to encroach upon their privileges. They began upon me. It is the militia they began upon. 
They confessed that the militia was mine, but they thought fit to have it from me. And to be short, if anyone will look but to the dates of the commissions, they will see clearly that they began their unhappy troubles, not I. Truly, I deserve their liberty and freedom as much as anybody whomsoever. But I must tell you, their liberty and freedom consists in having of government those laws by which their life and their souls may be their own. A subject and a sovereign are clean different things. Sirs, it was for this that now I am come here. If I would have given way, I needed not to have come here. And therefore, I tell you that I am the martyr of the people. I die a Christian according to the profession of the Church of England, as I found it left me by my father. I have a good cause, and I have a gracious God. I will say no more. The block was set low on the scaffold, prompting Charles to ask if it could be raised. It can be raised no higher, sir, came the reply from the nervous executioner. Charles, still calm and collected, told him that he would pray and then signal for him to strike. King Charles stood with his hands and eyes raised to heaven in prayer before eventually laying his head upon the block. Stay for the sign were the king's last words upon this earth. I will and please your majesty, said his executioner, who, upon seeing Charles's outstretched arms, swung his axe and severed his head with a single stroke. It was all over. On that freezing January afternoon in 1649, a royal martyr was born, and England slid into the uneasy years of the Commonwealth. Perhaps King Charles would enjoy the ultimate victory. For 11 years after his death, his son, Charles II, ascended the throne amid the emotion of the Restoration. Perhaps, after all, royal blood had not been spilt in vain.